So as I'm updating the firmware for my thrust test stand, um, I had to do a D-Shot implementation, and I just wanted to go through and, and talk through the actual uh, DMA implementation for uh, getting that to work. It's kind of an intermediate uh, thing, so if you're already reading data sheets and uh, configuring registers directly, uh, this will all be very plainly obvious. And if you're just used to Arduino for blinking LEDs and reading switches, this is going to be pretty advanced. So first, very quickly, the DSHOP protocol itself is digital protocol. It just encodes uh, the ones and the zeros in the duty cycle of a regular PWM signal, just like you would use an analog servo signal uh, in the first place. So conceptually, that's pretty straightforward. So if we just look at our update rate for the signal, our, our bit timing in this case, rather than the full throttle signal, a 1 is a 75% duty cycle, where we're high for 75% and low for the remaining, and then a zero is half that, about a 37.5%. So regardless what your data rate is, is 600, 300, 150, 1200, anything, uh, those duty cycles give you the bit timing for this protocol. That makes it really easy to use a built-in timer to generate this PWM train. So unlike kind of just a normal steady state PWM, uh, we do need to update the duty cycle every single pulse of the PWM because we're changing ones and zeros every every single bit and not just streaming out a fixed uh, duty cycle over time. But that's where DMA gets really useful. The data frame is two bytes long. The first 11 bits are your throttle signal. The 12th bit is a telemetry flag and the remaining four bits are a checksum. Calculating the checksum is really easy as well. Uh, all we have to do is take the first 12 bits, and then we take each of those nibbles and XOR them together. That just gets dropped into the checksum, and then you have your two-byte packet. When we pulse this packet out, we need to pulse it out starting with the most significant bit first. This is going to be important because typically if you're masking the first bit and shifting down to, uh, to generate the uh, output signal, you'll get least significant bit first, so we need to remember to reverse that order when we generate that pulse train so that we get the bits out in the right order. The last uh, thing that we have to remember is when setting up the throttle signal, values 1 through 47 are reserved for non-throttle things for setting beep codes and, and stuff like that. Um, so your zero throttle signal will be a throttle value of 48. That doesn't make any difference here on the data frame level, but when we're packing this data frame uh, in our implementation, we want to make sure that we uh, account for that. Now the first implementation is really straightforward and re really simple. I'm building off a Teensy 3.6. This is for a Freescale Kinetis series uh, K66 microcontroller. It's not going to be the same as uh, what you'll see on the flight controllers as, or uh, ST Micro and other families of, of ARM processors. Um, but the, uh, the general idea of it should be fairly similar. In my case, um, I only need to write out DSHOT to a single pin. Uh, the thrust stand only controls a single ESC, so I don't need to uh, do programmability or have four or six outputs or any of that stuff. So what I have set up is uh, I'm using one of the high resolution flex timers on the microcontroller and using one of its channel outputs that is can be connected through the multiplexer directly to the output pin. So what we're kind of looking at is something like this. Here in the top we have little marks at every single time that the master clock rolls over. Uh, so this is the beginning of the each uh, bit timing. Then we have our channel 1 which is set to, to fire just before the clock rolls over. And every single time that fires we get a DMA event and that triggers the DMA to look and here we don't have any DMA, the DMA is disabled so it fires the DMA uh, interrupt request, DMA is disabled, it doesn't do anything. Same thing here, we have our second bit, DMA is still disabled, it doesn't do anything. When we come to this one, uh, our channel 1 fires, the DMA triggers and now it's enabled. The first byte in the array happens to be a 37%. So this DMA loads that 37% into, we still haven't, we're, 
right at the end of this clock cycle here. So you see we haven't quite reached all the way at the end and that loads up for the next clock cycle which begins right there just before it says the next pulse you do is going to be 37% duty cycle. We get to the next pulse channel 2 has a new value loaded it loads 37% it triggers 37% duty cycle and then right before the end of that clock we have another DMA event. The next byte in that array is also a 37% so it loads 37% into that duty cycle for channel 2 the next bit also comes out cycle comes out as 37% duty cycle continuing on and on the next one 75% so these two there's these are two zeros the next one just before the end loads a 75% and we get a long pulse for this one and this is a 1. And then the final DMA event here triggers and we have a 0% loaded. We have no high value at all and it returns down to no and, and now we have uh, the DMA disabled and it continues to leave uh, the channel set to uh, set low so we're not getting any pulses out at all. So this shows pulsing out a 001 in the same protocol. The heart of this really all comes down to just setting up that timer. In my setup function, all we have to do is we're using uh, flex timer zero uh, because that's the one that has the uh, channels assigned to the, the output pin that I happen to be using. Uh, we can, before we uh, change the settings, we disable it and we reset the counter. Uh, we can pre-calculate the clock rate of the counter based on our bus speed and the uh, bit clock that we're using uh, for D-Shot, if we're using 600 or 300 or whatever, uh, and then set the timer up using that clock rate so the timer will roll, roll over once every bit clock. Then we set the main control register for the master flex timer zero. Uh, we give it the clock source one, which clocks off our F-Bus, and set a pre-scale to zero so we're not uh, pre-scaling that signal. Now, we're going to use two channels on this timer. One of them is going to actually pulse the output pin, and that'll be muxed directly to the physical pin output. And the second channel we're going to use to trigger the DMA event. In this case, I'm not going to be starting or stopping the, uh, the timer every time I want to send a new data packet out. Um, I'm just going to load the uh, DMA and then let it free fire the next clock. So the master timer will be no more than one clock behind when we actually begin uh, setting up the DMA transfer. So we set up the transfer and the next time that the uh, data clock rolls over then it'll immediately start transferring out uh, the bits that we uh, have configured. So here I'm setting the channel 1 flex timer clock enabling it to uh, PWM edge centric PWM mode and also turning on interrupts and DMA requests for this channel. This is the channel that we're going to use to trigger the DMA request. Uh, channel 2 we set up just to be PWM, PWM edge mode. Uh, that's going to be our actual output channel. Then we set the value of channel 1 kick us off almost at the very end and then the channel 2 value we set to just 0 because on when we initialize the thing we want the channel output to be just flat 0 it's not pulsing any uh, numbers out so we don't want it to be high for any duty cycle. Then we set up the Teensy DMA buffer outputs which is incredibly simple we just define a source buffer uh, which in this case is an array of duty cycles for each bit. The buffer length is a one byte for each of the 16 bits in our transfer plus an extra byte to set the uh, duty cycle to zero so at the end of the transfer it'll automatically go low and sit low until the next transfer begins. Set so the destination of the DMA transfer to be the register that configures the value for uh, timer channel 2. The transfer size is just one byte, transfer count is equal to our buffer length, and then we set the DMA to disable itself automatically on completion. Last up for the DMA is to set it up to trigger at the flex timer zero channel one, which we have already enabled the DMA for. So every time the flex timer one triggers, it'll automatically fire off the DMA. And then in the final one, we set up the multiplexer to the flex timer channel two pin to the physical output pin on the processor.
to calculate the checksum, all we need to do is generate that 12-bit packet of the throttle value shifted over by one, and then the least significant bit is our uh, telemetry flag, whether we want a telemetry response or not. Right shift by four bits and XOR it, do that twice, and then mask off the lower nibble, and you've got your checksum value. To fill the DSHOT buffer, we assemble our data packet with that throttle value and telemetry flag. We shift it over and drop in the checksum, and then all we have to do is step through every single bit in this 16-bit packet and stuff it into the command buffer, uh, pre-calculating what the duty cycle is for that bit. And this is where we reverse it. In this case, we're incrementing from zero. We're doing the simple flagging off uh, the least significant bit and then left shifting each pass. Uh, and then we start loading the buffer from the top 15 minus i. And then we have our dshot one timing, dshot zero timing that have our preset percentages. So it will figure out if we've got a one or a zero and then fill that buffer spot with the percentage duty cycle for a one or a zero. Once the buffer's full, there really isn't anything else to do. It, firing off a dshot command with this particular setup is, is very uncomplex. Uh, the timer runs, free runs in the background uh, and doesn't require any maintenance. We don't have any timing critical starts or stops uh, to do. All we have to do is uh, pack that uh, command buffer uh, with that duty cycles and then turn on that DMA channel. It'll automatically get triggered at the end of the next cycle and load the first duty cycle into that uh, channel to value register. And then every single bit after that will advance that count. The final bit we've always set to be zero. So at the end of that one, it'll set a duty cycle zero, return that timer output to be low, uh, and then it automatically disables itself. So the next cycle comes around and it doesn't get triggered because uh, it has turned itself off. When I was looking at uh, example imp implementations of, of other things that uses so similar sort of stuff. There was another implementation that I thought was really interesting that uses more DMA channels, but lets you set as many output pins as you want and doesn't require uh, pin access to the timer channels directly. So this is basically what the uh, the Octo WS2811 library does uh, in, in the TNC. They use DMA transfers as well. Uh, they happen to be uh, outputting an entire port's worth of uh, pins instead of a single one or a, a specific one. But there's some things that we can take advantage of uh, that are really handy that let us use the same idea a little more broadly. And what we want to take advantage of in this case is the timing of the individual bit. So rather than we're, we're not just setting a single channel anymore, uh, we're going to use the timers to directly set the pin output ports uh, to what we want. So the timing of the signal is really interesting. If you look at it overlaid here, we're looking at uh, one bit timing section here. Uh, and we have the waveform of that shows an, a one and a zero overlaid on top of each other. So the one is here at 75% duty cycle and the zero is here ending at half that length just before it. And we can break this down actually into rather than looking at it as just a single number for this pulse with uh, one duty cycle, we can set timers up. Instead of DMA transferring the duty cycle in, will set three events, basically every time we have a potential change. So here, right at the beginning of the bit, uh, we always want to transition from low to high. So here we'll always set the output pin to be high. Here, we potentially, we have a decision to make. If we're doing a zero, we set the output pin to be low. And if we're doing a one, then we stay high. So we can go either direction. And then here at the final timing stuff, we're always going low. Even if we're, if we have already sent a zero, we're already low. So setting it low again doesn't hurt. And if we're doing a one, this is when we want to turn it off and return to low for the final uh, section of that bit. So within each bit, if we set up three channels on the timer to fire off DMA transfers at every one of these three sections, we can use those DMA transfers to load the output ports for as many pins as we want, and we'll toggle that just as quickly as directly hooking it up to the uh, 
the waveform of the individual channels themselves. And we don't have to worry about uh, whether a the timer pin uh, can multiplex to the physical output or not. We can use just any arbitrary timer that has these three channels that we need and hook it up to any output. Now the fast way to do this is we want to directly set the output pin and we're going to use the the port register for that pin to do that. The port register has one bit per output pin and so if we have in this case if we set the third bit to a one then each of these is hooked up to a single output pin and that would light this output. You know these other pins are zeros and they're all turned off. So if we set that pin to be instead of zero the output pin turns off really really fast no there's no uh, delay in, in setting that the problem is we can't dma transfer just one bit we can only move full bytes and if we want to set this pin on and we set this value into the port this will set this pin on but what if before we also had this pin turned on when we transfer this in this is going to stomp on that output value and set that port to zero and it's going to turn this completely unrelated pin, who knows what that's hooked up to, it's going to turn it off and we don't want that at all. Conveniently, with this microcontroller, we've got three other ports that don't just allow us to directly set the value, but they allow us to either enable, disable, or toggle the value of a pin. This gives us the PSOR, PSOR, and PTOR register set that's for set, clear, and toggle. So if we use this, if we have this output set in our port and we use a set, because we're setting 0, 0, 0, it doesn't set that pin. It doesn't set it to 0. It sets this, sets this on. Don't turn that on. Don't turn that on. Don't turn that on. We have a 1 and it'll turn this channel on no matter what it's set to. If it was a one, it leaves it on. If it's a zero, it flips it to be on. So we can then give it just this byte value and don't have to worry about stomping on any pin except for the one that we set. So we just need to use two of these registers, the set and the clear, and then when we fill our buffer instead of setting the pulse width for the thing we will fill basically a full uh, pin register so we'll have we'll find out our our pin mapping uh, for each of the output port registers and then we'll use that as a mask and apply that into the array for each of these sections at the very beginning of the cycle, we set everything to one so that we get a high value output. And then when we get to the second one, uh, we have an inverted, uh, we'll invert that byte value. So if it's a zero, we will set the clear bit and then it'll turn that value off. And then for the final one, when we get to the final, the, uh, the trigger for the uh, one, then we always will clear that, that pin value and it'll return us to, to low. And how this is great is we don't have to just set a single pin on this port. We can set multiple pins with every single transfer and we can turn them on or off. And when we will, we kind of will, will bit stripe uh, these values in and then every single uh, pin that we want to turn on will add that mask to the uh, byte that gets DMA transferred in and every single pin that we're setting can be set differently from each other so we can have different pins outputting different values on the exact same timing uh, using one uh, DMA transfer. As long as they're on the same port internally uh, on the Teensy it's 16-bit uh, ports uh, and uh, the ones that I'm, I'm working on in this example are going to be on port C. Uh, if you needed to toggle using this method pins on multiple ports you had pins on port a and pins on port c you would need to set up a different set of dma transfers to the uh the p and p core uh for the other port 
as well, and then stripe those uh, when you're filling your uh, command buffer. So the code for this one's a little more complicated. Uh, we've had a little more shuffling around to do, uh, and there's some timing critical parts that we need to keep things synchronized. Uh, setting up the timer uh, is roughly similar in the beginning. The, the master timer was set up exactly the same way, setting the uh, uh, our G-Shock clock frequency uh, and the clock source and prescaler and all that. Uh, we're still setting up uh, only two channels on there, uh, both as a uh, rising edge, um, edge centered uh, PWM and setting up for uh, DMA and uh, interrupt requests. But the values, we're fixing those values right at the start uh, so that the first channel is set to trigger every single time a zero value decision needs to be made and the channel one is set to trigger every single time a one value needs to be made. Uh, here it's also mapping the interrupt uh, for uh, the master clock because it's not uh, set up on an in, a individual um, timer channel. Uh, and then we use three DMA channels. Even though we're using three DMA channels we still only have one command buffer array because the first DMA channel is just going to get fed a, a bit mask of all of the pins that are involved in the, the D-Shot transfer. Uh, because every single bit that we send out is exactly the same. At the beginning of each clock, the, the, uh, the line gets set high. So we don't have to, we, we, there are no decisions to be made. Every time that clock, we automatically transfer to PSOR that sets those pins high the uh, pin mask transfer size of one and it transfers 16 times because we've got a 16 byte frame channel two is where we do the actual decision making so we're pointing this at the command buffer and setting our our destination register to be uh, p core so we're clearing that pin value by setting a one in its uh, that pin's position. The third DMA channel is always going to clear the pin when we reach that end of the longest one bit. So again, we don't need an array for that. We just always give it the pin mask and set it to go to PCOR. Uh, then at the end, we, we trigger all of the, the uh, DMA channels on their respective uh, events. Uh, the DMA1 that sets it high gets set to that port 1 interrupt that happens every single time the master clock goes uh, overflows and DMA2 and 3 get set to their channel you know the channel 1 and 2 timers uh, respectively. Packing the uh, command buffer is not really complicated uh, but we have to remember that we're not setting the value of the pin we're setting a mask on a register that's going to set the value of a pin. So in this case, if we if we have a one in that particular bit position, we're not setting the value to one, we're telling it to not turn off the pin. So if we have a zero value, then we set the pin mask to that command value so that every bit that's set to one is transferred out as a zero. And the actual writing uh, writing things is, is more complicated in this one because we're not just setting the duty cycle, uh, we have to stop the timer and reset it because if we just start firing DMA events uh, randomly, we could be right in the middle because we've got these three clock uh, events that are synchronized and if we start transferring right in the middle of one then you get a weird output because you haven't set you haven't set the first part of the uh, first bit and then you're just trying to set the, the middle section and then you lose a bit at the, the front or the the timer rolls over stuff doesn't get reset um, the first thing we need to do when we write to this one is it waits for the master clock to roll over and then turns off the clock before, hopefully before it finishes. And then we can reset all of the outstanding ISRs. And then once we're sure the master stop is clocked and there are no outstanding interrupt requests, uh, we can turn on all three DMA channels and then enable the master clock again. And then it'll start picking up our, our transfers the next cycle round. Now this is all basically straight from 
uh, the Teensy, the WS2811 implementation. Uh, so I think that this could potentially, for, for DShot at least, um, I think that this could run, uh, you don't necessarily need all of these, uh, this timing critical stuff. This leaves, basically leaves the master clock as running as it can so that each, uh, each bit doesn't uh, necessarily drift in, in time bit uh, uh, frame to frame when you have a space in between because it keeps the master clock running and then only uh, stops and restarts the, the clock when you're loading a new sequence of bits to send out where DShot doesn't really care. Uh, so I think all of this waiting for the uh, the clock to, to roll over and then stopping it before reloading it, um, I'm pretty sure that you could just stop the clock and reset all of the counters to zero um, and get the same thing and then you don't have to wait for two bit clocks uh, to cycle through uh, before you begin clocking this next one. And I played with that for a little bit and it, it worked okay, um, but obviously I ended up using the uh, the single DMA channel because I'm not, I, I don't need to bit mask uh, a whole port to do the thing and so that ended up being a lot simpler. But I thought this was a, a really kind of clever way to use just three DMA channels to control, uh, in this case up to 16 pins as long as they're on a, a single port. And then kind of the only complication you have is, is uh, you know, creating your, your bit stripe when you're filling that buffer uh, with every single pin with its own uh, command value.